Well, good evening, Stoutsville. How you doing? Good? It is good to be back. I'll tell you what's really... Man, you're not kidding. That does look good. It's awesome. It is good to be back. Um, Stoutsville, this, this feels like coming home for me now. And uh, I'll tell you, that I still remember the first year that I showed up, and I had no idea what to expect. And uh, you guys immediately made me feel like family. Coming back here is always one of the highlights of my year. So thanks for having me. Hopefully it's been an amazing camp for you already. Uh, thanks to Stephen. I've been watching live stream at camp just to try to get caught up on what's going on. And I've been following along with pictures. It looks like God's been doing some really cool things already. And we're going to pray that he continues to do that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be turning to a passage in 2 Kings chapter 6. Thanks, Ed, for throwing that one out there today. I appreciate that. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 6. And I was telling Ed a little while ago, one of the things that's fascinating to me about this passage is that of all the, the 17 years now in ministry, I think this is probably one of the passages that I preached out of the least. And, uh, and yet it's one that God's been drawing my heart towards, and uh, I'm excited to see what he wants to do in this place. Now, as you're turning there, as you're finding that passage, this place where all of this takes place in this, this chapter is a place called Dothan. Now, Dothan has a rich history for the people of Israel. This is the place where Joseph was sold into slavery. So, right, that's the significance of this place. It has a rich heritage and history for the Israelite people. At this point, Elisha now is the, the spiritual leader of Israel. Uh, after getting a, a double dose, this massive dose of God's spirit, from Elijah on him, this anointing on his life. Elisha has now served as the spiritual leader of Israel. And what I love about Elisha is Elisha is a man of prayer. He's a man of prayer. And because of that, what we find is God gives him this supernatural ability to see things that other, other humans are not able to see. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that's one of the biggest problems for me, is not being able to see what God wants me to see. If you have your Bibles, we're going to begin reading together today in verse 8 of chapter 6. Verse 8, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel, and after conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place, Indicated by the man of God, time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Well, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. And the report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the entire city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. And Elisha told them, This isn't the road, this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them into the middle of Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside of Samaria. And when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Did you kill men you captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their masters. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. And the bandits from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm excited about what you want to do in this place tonight. I'm excited about the way that you want to move 
and work in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray that you do just that. Work just as much on my heart tonight as you do through me. I pray, God, that you would get me out of the way and that your words would speak into me and flow out of me to the ears and the hearts of the people that are listening. And I pray, God, that you would give us not only ears that hear, but hearts that listen. And the courage to respond to whatever it is that you ask of us in this place. And Lord, in keeping in line with this text, I pray that you give us eyes to see. Open up the curtains of heaven and give us just a glimpse of who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. Because I believe, God, if we have those kind of eyes, it will radically change our view of you, our view of ourselves, and our view of our world. So, Father, I pray that you would let that happen to us tonight. Speak, Lord. We're going to listen. And we're going to respond. Lord, we love you. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Amen. Now, growing up, I was a big cartoon fan. Any cartoon fans in here? I, I used to be old, right? I'm not talking about these new junkie cartoons, right? I'm talking old school Looney Tunes, right? Anybody else been doing that? Now, don't get me wrong. There's some good stuff out there. I'm like an old school Looney Tunes guy. And I also love Tom and Jerry. Anybody watch Tom and Jerry? Right? Okay. I knew I was going to find somebody in here. I was going, Tom and Jerry. I love Tom and Jerry. And here's what I love about Tom and Jerry. It never failed. The little mouse always got the better of the cat. Right? And, and there were a few episodes of Tom and Jerry that were my favorites. And they were the ones that involved a, a bulldog named Spike. You know what I'm talking about? And these were, these were like my favorites because if Spike had a little boy, his name was just known as Tyke, or over top of his, his doghouse, he just said, son. Right? I love this. And inevitably, Tyke would always get himself in a little bit of trouble. He put himself right smack dab in the middle of whatever confrontation was happening between Tom and Jerry. And Tom was not the least bit afraid of Tyke. In fact, he liked to torment Tyke. He liked to put Tyke in his place. He liked to you know, throw Tyke to the side so he could move on and get to Jerry. There was just one problem. If he did that around Spike, what would happen? He would get walloped every single time. And so my favorite moments that happened to Tom and Jerry went like this. Tom thinks that he's in the clear and he can do whatever he wants to to Tyke. And Tyke decides he wants to be a tall, big, strong bulldog like his daddy, and, and Tom is not having it. But this Tyke is not scared at all, and he's just puffing up his chest, and he's barking like crazy, and then all of a sudden, Spike comes in behind Tyke, and Tyke has no idea he's there, right? Then Spike comes in behind Tyke, and he raises up his chest, and he kind of looks over at Tom, and he's like, listen, if you mess with him, you mess with me. Now, Tyke has no idea this is going on, and so Tom takes off, and Tyke feels like he's scared off the big old mean cat, right? Like, I love this, this whole story that takes place in Tom and Jerry. I, I can't help but think about that story when I read this passage. Now, some of you sit back and go, what? Like, did we get the same passage? Like, you just read, like, this crazy thing about Elisha and whatever. Listen, my brain is crazy, right? I think weird like that, but I'm telling you, bear with me for just a second, because I think some of you might come along with me. Here's the story, in a nutshell. Here's the Cliff's Notes version of this. Elisha has been granted power by God to tell him where Aram, the king of Aram, where the Arameans are going to attack the Israelites. In the middle of the night, God says, hey, hey, Elisha, this is the plan. They're going to be here, they're going to be there. You tell the king to avoid those places. We're going to protect Israel together. And so Elisha would wake up, he'd go over to the king's palace, he'd sit down with the king, and he said this, Hey, God told me that the king of Aram has set up his troops over here. You need to avoid that place. And time after time after time after time, that happened. It got so absurd. It happened so many times that the king of Aram decided there had to be a spy in his ranks. There's got to be a spy. So he calls together all of his generals, and he sits down with them, and he goes, okay, which one of you is for them? And they're all looking at each other, like, not us. Not us. It's Elisha. God has been telling him your plans, even the secret ones that you only talk about by yourself in the bedroom. He knows everything. And the king of Aaron is thinking to himself, this is no good. It's no good. 
So I'll tell you what, you find out where he is, I'll send my army and we'll go get him. And then once he's out of the way, we can get on to the business of attacking Israel. So that's what they did. Word comes back, Elisha's in Dothan, which is kind of a small town. It's not very well protected. It's not very big. It's about 60 miles outside of Samaria. There's not a whole lot going on. And in the middle of the night, the king of Aram moves all of his troops there to surround the city. And in the morning, when Elisha's servant wakes up, he looks out the window and goes, uh, this is bad news. And he begins to freak out a little. He gets a little scared. And he runs in and he looks at Elisha and he says, I have no idea what we're going to do. Like, we're in major trouble. And Elisha looks out the front door and he calmly says this. Man, this ain't nothing. This ain't nothing. And then he says something to Gehazi that must have completely thrown him for a loop. He looks at Gehazi and he says this. There are more with us than there are with them. There is more with us than our And I picture Gehazi looking around the house. And he points at Elisha, he points at himself, and he starts to count on his fingers, and he's going, Elisha's lost his mind. He's lost his mind. And Elisha takes just a brief moment, and he prays a quick prayer, and this is all he says. God, will you help him see what I see? Would you just... Just peel back the curtains of heaven for a second and give him a glimpse of what I see. And in that moment, Gehazi's eyes are opened to a whole other spiritual plane. And he sees chariots of fire and armies of angels surrounding the hillside all around Elisha's house. And Gehazi's going, okay, this is a game changer. This is this is a game changer. And then Elisha prays the second prayer. All right, God, here's what I'd like you to do. You open his eyes. Now I want you to shut theirs. I want you to blind them. And then he does. And Elisha walks out into the middle of this army. And he goes, hey, boys, are you lost? This ain't where you want to be. Follow me. I'll get you there. And, of course, a bunch of blind army soldiers are going to just blindly follow and they blindly follow Elisha, and he leads them into the center of the city of Samaria, surrounded by the armies of Israel, and he prays that God open, opens their eyes. God opens their eyes, and they look around, and they realize they're the ones that are ambushed. Now, the king of Israel wants to have some fun with this. He, he's thinking, all right, you've delivered them in my hands, let's just kill them all. And so I love the fact that they look at Elisha, and they say, hey, man, let me add it. Can we kill him now? Can we kill him now? I said, no! Come on! God just delivered them supernaturally to us. Let's do what any good Israelite would do when an army is delivered to us. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. In fact, I want you to cook the best food you could cook and serve it to them. Wait, 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 wait. You mean you want to invite them to the party? Well, yeah, they're here. Why not? And so here's the craziness of the story. There's a group of these army soldiers that think that they're going to have an easy job taking Elisha out. That doesn't go according to the plan. And then there's the Israelites who think they've got an easy plan to take out the Aramaeans who are now trapped inside of Samaria. And that doesn't go according to the plan. And instead, they all decide, hey, let's just have a truce and eat some food and hang out together. And then he sends them back on their way. The scripture tells us in the last verse that we read that that was the beginning of a time of peace between the Aramaeans and the Israelites. I don't know about you, but for me, I read this story and I ask myself, Lord, why can't I have that kind of vision? Why can't I have that kind of vision? Because let me be really honest with you. This, this is the way my life works. I'm going to be very transparent. This is the way my life works. When things don't go my way, and circumstances get to the point where I feel surrounded and closed in by the world and all the things that are happening in my life, the only thing I see is my problems. That's all I see. 
That's all, I, that's all I can get my head wrapped around is what is right in front of me. I see the, the job that's driving me crazy, or I see the, the bills that are constantly coming in, or I see the car that's constantly breaking down, or I see the water leak that just happened in my house. And I said, right, like, I see all of these troubles. I see that really bad diagnosis that came across about my family member that I love so much. I see my friends that aren't living the life they're supposed to live. I see the struggles that we're having in the church. I see, I, I see all those things. And I, for whatever reason, in the midst of those problems, the last thing I see is God. The last thing that I see is God. And the reality is, as much as I like to think and talk and act like I understand the life of Elisha, the reality is I have eyes like Gehazi. I have eyes like Gehazi. My eyes focus in on the temporary, broken things of life. And this is what I forget. I forget that God's got my six. God's got my six. I, I don't know if any of you were in the military. I don't know about the military. I've got some guys in my small group right now that were over in Afghanistan. And they serve so faithfully. And I love the camaraderie and the relationship they have with each other. I'm telling you, these guys are as close as anybody I've ever seen. And constantly, they'll be talking about supporting one another and taking care of one another. And the moment they just simply say this, I got your six. I got your back. I'm going to take care of what you can't see. I'm going to protect you. And I love that about them. That's what's happening in this passage of Scripture. We're taking notes. Write this down. Our confidence is often shaken as a result of our inability to see what God is doing. Our confidence is often shaken. As a result of our inability to see what God is up to. It's easy to lose confidence when we don't see what God's doing behind the scenes. And the reality is, very rarely do we get to see what God is doing behind the scenes. What I think is really interesting is that our eyes, our vision gets cloudy. And when that happens, we begin to struggle with anxiety and depression and brokenness and fear. And those things begin to overwhelm us because all we see is the brokenness. And for whatever reason, and I think perhaps maybe one of the greatest tools of the devil is simply this. If I can cloud your vision, I will shake your faith. Yeah. If I can cloud your vision, I will shake your faith. And this isn't anything new, right? This goes all the way back to the garden. The God of the universe creates everything. He gives the entire world to humanity. He gives the entire world to Adam and Eve. And for whatever reason, the serpent comes in and just simply drops one little bomb that clouds Eve's vision. And it changed everything. Right? The serpent says, hey, God doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to eat of that tree. And in that moment, for whatever reason, Eve gets tunnel vision that's so cloudy she can't see the entire world that God created. And all she can see is that one little thing, that seed that was sown by Satan, and she lost sight of everything else. This isn't a new problem. We have the same problem today. Some of you, undoubtedly, your faith over the course of the last 12 months, the last few weeks, the last few days even, your faith has been tested because you have the inability to see through the cloudiness of what Satan's doing and really see that God is there on your side. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, if I could figure out the eyes of Elisha versus the eyes of Gehazi, I think my faith would rise exponentially. But for many of us in this room, we can't get past whatever it is right here in front of us to see that the God of angel armies is all around us. Now, I don't know, I don't know who it is in this room that this is for, but I want you to hear me when I say this. If you're in this room tonight and you have wrestled with anxiety and depression and fear to the point where it grips you and you can't even hardly move, you don't want to get out of bed, you can't see light at the end of the tunnel. Darkness has overcome you in a way that there is no hope in sight for you. I want you to understand that the biggest thing you need to be praying for is the vision of Elisha. And give up the eyesight of the hospital. I don't know where you're at, but I want you to know that when we have limited sight, we cannot see the possibilities. Right? We can't see the possibilities. In Central and South America, there's this little minnow-like fish. And scientists have given it a really important, specific, scientific name. They call it four eyes. <laughs> I don't know why. 
I didn't make this up. It's just true, right? There's this little minnow that swims up the streams of the rivers in Central and South America. And it's fascinating because it has two eyes, but the eyes actually have two compartments, a lower compartment and an upper compartment. So it swims along the surface of the water, and the upper half of the eyes are up above the water line, and the lower half of the eyes are below the water line, and the lower half of the eyes are meant to be able to see the bent light in the water so they can see their food below them. But the upper half is normal so that they can see the prey that's trying to take them out from above. They have the ability to both see the protection and the provision at the same time. Now, I don't know how that works, right? I and mean, I think it's crazy. They're freaky looking. Google it. It's crazy, right? Like, not right now. Later. Right? But it, it's crazy. They're crazy looking. And what's really crazy about these things is I, after I read about them and saw them, I said, Lord, give me that kind of vision. Give me the kind of sight, the kind of vision that allows me to both see simultaneously the protection of you and the provision from you. God, give me the ability to somehow see not only what is around me, but above and below it. The problem for most of us in this room is all we see is straight ahead. And we don't see what's above us. We don't see what's below us. And we do not see what God is doing, where God is, and how God wants to protect and provide for us. That was Gehazi's problem. Now, Gehazi's problem started way before this. In fact, if you read the chapter before, you find out Gehazi has always been short-sighted. Because there had actually been this truce that had kind of taken place between Aram and Israel before this event had happened. Because God, through Elisha, had healed the captain of the guard, the lead of the armies of Aram. From, he healed him from leprosy. And in return... This guy wanted to pay Elisha. And Elisha's like, listen, your money's no good here. It's not about the money. I don't want your money. God wanted to heal you. That's awesome. And he sent him on his way. But Elisha's servant felt like, hey, this is an opportunity. I can take advantage of this. So he goes and runs outside chasing after the captain of the guard. And he says, hey, we're just kidding. I'd like a little bit of money and some clothes for that. The guy's like, okay, here. He gives it to Gehazi. When Gehazi shows back up the house, Elisha looks at him and says, hey, man, where'd you go? Gehazi's like, I didn't go anywhere. I've been here the whole time. And Elisha is like, dude, you've been around me a long time. Like, you know that God tells me things. I know where you were. I know what you did. And from now on, you and your entire family will have lovers. Gehazi's had a vision problem for a long time, right? All he ever wanted to see was right in front of him. He looked for opportunities himself. He looked at circumstances by himself. He never saw the bigger picture of what God was doing. And before we're too quick to judge him, let's be really honest. If we were to sit back and look at the majority of our life, isn't that what our life looks like? We're constantly looking and chasing after and pursuing our dreams and our goals and our wishes and our desires. We're trying to satisfy what we want. And we miss out on the bigger picture of what God's doing. And then, whenever bad things happen and difficulties come into play and life gets tough, all we can see are those things right in front of us and we lose sight of what God's doing. And when that happens, our confidence is shaken. And anxiety and fear and depression and brokenness begin to build because we can't see anything beyond our problems. I think in our world today, now more than ever, this is something that I think many people need to hear. My God is bigger than my problems. My God is bigger than my problems. Let's, let's be really honest. And I'm not talking, I'm not even touching on the mental health thing. I'm talking about anxiety. I'm just talking about when you and I really wrestle with self-worth, when we wrestle with anxiety and fear and brokenness, most of the time when we really are struggling with that, it's because our eyes are only on our problems. Our eyes are only on the mistakes. Our eyes are only on the brokenness. Our eyes are only on the temporary. Our eyes are not on Jesus. And I think sometimes what God wants to say to us is, hey, if you would pray to me, I might just open up the curtains of heaven and give you a glimpse of the fact that I'm here and I am bigger than your problem. 
I'm bigger than your problem. But for whatever reason, one of, one of us, one, one time or another, many of us in this group have wrestled with this idea. And we forget that this help is bigger than our need. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said this. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the air. And in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus rebuked Peter by saying, Don't you think that I can't call thousands of angels down from heaven? Like, I, am I begging you call? I got an entire army ready. All, everyone who was there when Stephen was stoned to death was looking at Stephen dying. And Stephen, the only one, got a glimpse of what God was doing. Amen. Right? Amen. Why? Because when we figure out that God is up to something bigger than ourselves, and we realize that God is, God's help is bigger than our needs, we get a glimpse of something that is way more filled with hope than we could imagine. Write this down. Victory over fear and anxiety comes when we begin to focus on God's presence rather than our problems. And it's time for us to start to get this. Fear happens when we mistakenly believe that God is not able to handle our problems. And you know what's crazy? The term, the phrase, fear not, is in Scripture 365 times. 365 times in Scripture, the words fear not appear, which means there's one for every day. 365 times, God reminds us, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. When I wake up tomorrow morning, I don't have to be afraid. When I wake up the next morning, I don't have to be afraid. Why? Because the God of angel armies is on my side. But for, for whatever reason, we forget and we become afraid. Listen to these passages, right? Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hebrews 13, 6. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? Psalm 3, verse 6. I will not fear the tens of thousands draw up against me on every side, because God is on my side. Amen. Amen. 1995, there was a guy named Randy. He was working construction, building a building in Chicago. And, uh, and as he was working, he, he couldn't quite reach the, the supply line of all the things that he needed next. And so he made a fatal mistake. He unclipped and unhooked his safety harness as he was walking on the 11th floor of this building that was incomplete. He began to reach over to grab some of the materials that he needed, and just at that moment, a gust of wind in the windy city of Chicago caused him to lose his balance, and he fell 110 feet. He landed face down in a loose pile of dirt that had been piled up by the excavator just hours before. He missed all of the rubble and all the rebar that was about six inches from him. They quickly call the squad. The squad shows up. He doesn't move. They eventually get him to talk. And he said, my back hurts. And they're like, well, no, no, you just fell 110 feet. They rolled him over very carefully. They put him on a backboard and they lifted him up. And six guys began to carry him over to the ambulance. And as they're carrying him, he got so freaked out that he looked at them and said, please don't drop me. <laughs> Isn't that like us, though? We go through life, and we trust God with our 110-foot problems, but the three-foot problems sink us. Isn't it? Like, we will trust God with our eternity, but we won't trust Him with our checkbook. We'll trust God with our eternity, but we won't trust Him with that diagnosis of the doctor's office. We'll trust God that He will have our back for eternity, but we won't trust Him when our friends abandon us, or when we lose that job, or when something goes wrong with our car. Like, isn't that crazy? We who call ourselves followers of Jesus say, I will put my entire eternity in His hands. But then we get scared to death when the world throws us a curve. You want to know why that's a problem? It's a problem because we lose sight of where our confidence is supposed to come from. Our help comes from the Lord. Amen. And Elisha looks at Gehazi and he's going, Gehazi, man, you've been with me a long time. You've been with me a long time. And if you've not learned, any, have you not learned anything in the entire time that we have been leading Israel, 
You have time after time after time settled for seeing the temporary things and you're not catching up on what God is doing. So Elisha just simply says, hey God, open his eyes for a second. Give him a glimpse of what I see. And in that moment, it had to change Gehazi forever. Holy smokes. All around Elisha's house, angel armies, chariots of fire. If God is for me, who can be against me? I, I don't know what you're struggling with tonight. I have no idea. I do know you've been hearing some great sermons. You've been hearing some amazing sermons about God's grace and God's redemption and God's calling and the need for sanctification. I, man, that's awesome stuff. But for whatever reason, I feel like tonight, there's some of us in this room that we just needed to take a step back and go, you know what? I'm struggling with my faith walk because all I see is right here. That's all I see. I've been struggling with anxiety and fear and brokenness and depression and hurt because all I see is here. And God says, I want you to catch a glimpse of something bigger. And you might be sitting back and well, that's great, but how do we do it? Here it is. You ready? Write this down. Write this down. It's our intimacy with God that directly impacts our confidence in Him and our vision for what He's doing. It's our intimacy with God. You see, difficult circumstances are the truest test of our intimacy with and confidence in God's power and presence. You say, you say, Pastor Aaron, I, I have a hard time seeing what God is up to. That's probably because your intimacy with God is struggling. You say, Pastor Aaron, all I, all I can handle, all I can see is, is that, that bad thing that's going on in my life. Well, how's your relationship with God? You know what I love about this? In the midst of a chaotic moment, a crazy moment in which Elisha was literally surrounded by most of the army of Aram, he didn't panic. And the first thing he thought to do was what? Talk to Jesus. That's the first thing he did. He looks at God and he says, hey man, there's more with us than there are with them. Lord, please show him. You know what the second thing that he did was? He prayed to Jesus again. He prayed to God. He said, God, okay, now that you've opened Gehazi's eyes, close their eyes. There's only nine chapters in the entire Old Testament that talk about Elijah. That's it. And you know what he's doing in all nine chapters? He's praying. Amen. He's praying. That's it. I mean, this dude spends his entire life with this intimate relationship with the God of the universe, so much so that he talks to him any time a problem comes up. The first thing he does, whenever there's a hint of any kind of trouble, he just starts talking to God. And there's this beautiful intimacy that takes place between Elisha's willingness to communicate with God and God's willingness to give Elisha extra insight that other people are getting. You say, why did God choose Elisha to deliver all the plans of the Arameans to his hands? Well, probably because Elisha spent more time talking to him than anybody else. Amen. But why did God decide to let Elisha be the one to see the chariots of fire and the angel armies? Why? Well, probably because Elisha was the one that spent the bulk of his time getting to know God intimately. This isn't rocket science, but this is life-changing if we get it. If you and I learn to embrace an intimate relationship with God, He will give us vision that we don't currently have right now. And that vision is what enables us to live out a life of faith when all of our circumstances seem to be against us. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to call it for what it is. If you're here tonight and you're wrestling with your vision and your sight and your faith walk because all you can see are the struggles happening in your life, I want you to check your intimacy with God. Would you check your intimacy with God? Now hear me when I say this. Intimacy with God does not equate to deliverance from all of our problems. That's not what happened here, right? That's not what, intimacy with God equates to us seeing what God is up to despite our circumstances. Amen. That's the key, right? Intimacy with God enables us to have a, a vision of what God is up to, even though my life may seem to be falling apart on a temporary plane. Why? Because God is always up to something. We just don't always see it. 
And I believe the reason we don't see it is because we don't care enough to be as intimate with God as He wants us to be. But when we start to embrace an intimate life with God, it changes the way we see Him, it changes the way we look at ourselves, and it will ultimately change the way we see our problems. So, right after that, what are you wrestling with? What's the brokenness that's been driving you crazy? What's the fear and the anxiety and the depression that's been taking hold of you? What are the circumstances that seem insurmountable that you can't seem to break through? I want to remind you, our God is bigger than your problem. Amen. And the God of angel armies is still encamped around us. And he just wants us to have an intimate relationship with him enough to see that God is up to something even though we're struggling with the world that we live in. And it doesn't mean we may we, it may not mean that we're delivered from our problems. But it will mean that we'll have a different perspective that changes the way we deal with our problems. You see, God didn't deliver Gehazi from his letters. But he did give Gehazi eyes to see that God was still on the throne. And that changes everything. Yes. It changes everything. So I don't know where you're at tonight. I have no idea what you've been struggling with, what you've been going through. I have no idea the heartache and the pain and the fear and the anxiety. But my desire for all of us in this room is that we have the eyes of Elisha. We have the eyes of Elisha. Because if God is for us, He could be against us. And the God of angel armies is encamped around us. And He's just waiting for us to have an intimate relationship that allows us to see what He's up to. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I have no idea. I have no idea the heartache and the brokenness that, that's represented in this room. I really don't. I know in a room this size, there are probably, undoubtedly, people that have been wrestling with fear and anxiety and depression and self-worth and Lord, they're just overwhelmed. Lord, staggering statistics all around our world would say that, that maybe even as many as a third of the people in this room have been battling anxiety and depression. That some of them are struggling waking up in the mornings, getting out of bed in the mornings. Some of them are debilitated and crippled by fear because circumstances in life is just throwing everything that it can at them. You know what? That's what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to throw things at them so that their vision gets clouded and we lose sight of who you are and what you're doing in our life. So Father, if there's some in this room tonight that have been seeing you and the world through the eyes of Gehazi, I pray that you give them the eyes of Elijah. Open our eyes to see what you're up to. Open our eyes to see that you are for us. Open our eyes to see that you want to do something big in us and give us a deeper desire for an intimate relationship with you that will change everything. So Father, I pray in the moments that follow that you would speak. And I, I'm going to pray exactly what Elisha prayed. Lord, open their eyes so they can see. But there's more to this life than what the world is throwing at. There's a spiritual, eternal plane that you want us to begin to see and to live into and to prioritize that will change everything about our joy, change everything about our happiness, change everything about our priorities. And ultimately, Lord, provide deliverance from all of that brokenness and heartache and anxiety and fear and depression and give us confidence that in the midst of the brokenness of life, you are still on the throne. So, Father, if there's some in this room tonight that need the eyes of Elisha, give them the courage to respond in an altar of prayer as we sing together. Father, I thank you for the ones that have come around an altar tonight. We pray that you give them eyes like Elisha. To see that the God of angel armies around their life, but there's something bigger for them to see and aspire to than the temporary things that this world throws at us. For whatever brokenness and heartache and fear and anxiety and depression that may cripple them pales in comparison to the God who is bigger than the problems. Lord, even more than that, you 
want to give them a victory that is bigger than anything this world could offer. I think the part of the story that amazes me the most is that when you open the eyes of all the parties involved, it brought people together for a celebration that was bigger than no one saw coming. And Lord, I believe that if you did that in all of our hearts and in all of our lives, if you gave us eyes to see what you're up to, it would radically change the temperament and the attitude and the feelings of candy. Because Lord, I think if we really began to see you, if we really began to catch a glimpse of what you're up to, we would just be partying all day and night, celebrating the goodness and the greatness of God. And what I think is we began to do that, the empty seats in this tabernacle would be filled by people all around this place rushing to see what's going on. Yes. The reality is I'm afraid that many of us have settled for Gehazi's eyes. And we're missing out on the goodness and the greatness of our God. I pray, Lord, that tonight will be the beginning of a massive change for us. I pray, Lord, that not just the ones that are around the altar, but all of us in this place, that we would pray the prayer of Elisha, open our eyes so that we can see what you're up to. Because I think, God, if we get this, it changes everything. If we get this, it changes everything. I pray for the lives of those that, that are drastically being changed right now as a result of that prayer. But I pray that y'all can understand it doesn't mean that life is going to be perfect from now on, but it allows them to see from a different perspective. It enables them to have joy, peace, and contentment even in the midst of brokenness. For all of us in this room, we would be focused heavenward rather than what's going on around us. Because ultimately, God, that is that's what you aspire us to. We love you. Jesus love us. Amen. If you're going to take away anything tonight, at my church we call it something to tweet or post. If you don't have social media, that's fine. Write down and call a friend, right? If you're going to tweet or post anything this week, I want to be this. this I intimately become more aware of God's presence and power. I instinctively become less consumed by my fears and anxieties. I'm going to talk about a confidence boost. Eyes of Elisha change everything. Can we stand and sing that all together as we close tonight? Open your eyes, my brother. Let's just close that way.